Welcome, everybody. It's good to have you here tonight on this uh, beautiful day. We have a beautiful, sunshiny day here in Woodridge. Uh, the snow, uh, sorry, the snow, not the snow. The rain and the thunder is coming in, but that's okay. Uh, I hope that you're having a wonderful day today. Uh, come on in, have a seat wherever you are. Uh, gather your family, get the kids. Let's sit down and let's uh, have a wonderful time tonight meeting with the Lord on our Wednesday night Bible study. If you're here on Facebook, say hello. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like or a comment and let us know who's here. If you're here on YouTube, you can also leave comments there. You can use the live chat and say hello. So I hope that you're having a wonderful week. Uh, this is a special week. On Sunday, it was, of course, um, Palm Sunday, where the Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem for that final time. And then this coming Sunday is Easter. But this is the most unusual uh, Passion Week that I've ever experienced. And we unfortunately won't be together in the house of the Lord as we normally are on Easter, but we will be broadcasting. And uh, join with me in prayer that we can get through this as a nation very, 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 very soon and get back together again. But we're glad that you can be here tonight. Uh, we're going to have a good time. Go ahead. If you have your hymn book at home, if you have one of the great hymns of the faith, we're going to sing a familiar song. Uh, no slides tonight, but we're going to sing number 500, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, I'll Be There. If you know that song, sing it out. If you don't, I apologize. No words tonight on the screen. But if you have that hymn book, go ahead and open it. Uh, if you'd like a hymn book, uh, reach out to me. Let me know if you're local. Um, we have a few that we can uh, loan you. And uh, let me know if that's something you'd like us to do. All right. It's number 500 in the hymn book. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Verse 3 says, let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. I wonder how long roll call will take up in glory. It might take forever, <laughs> but that's okay. We're going to be there forever, amen? Uh, it's going to be a good day when we get to glory, and I hope there's a roll call, and we'll be able to hear the names uh, and the faces and see every single one that is gathered around the throne, all because of the blood of the Lamb. Jesus died for us. He was buried and rose again. And that's why we can have our names written down. And I hope that you'll be there uh, on that glorious day. All right, we're going to sing a song now that you might know by heart. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. So there's no hymn, hymn number for this one. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. 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 No turning back, no turning back. Though no one 
join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. All right, now go ahead and get your Bibles out. Turn to Psalm 19. Because we're going to sing a psalm, Psalm 19. I hope that you'll enjoy this. This is a scripture song. We're not going to sing the whole psalm. But the song begins in verse 7 and goes down to verse 11. So the way it works is it goes like this. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And then it goes to the chorus, which is verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. When we get to the last verse, which would be actually verse, um, verse 9, then we do the chorus, and then we add a little coda on there, which is verse 11. If that's, if that's confusing, that's okay. <laughs> Just hang on and find your way through it. All the words come straight out of the text, and so listen as I show you how it works. I'm going to start in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. For to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Also then honey and the honeycomb. See, we went from verse 7 and jumped to verse 10 as the chorus. Let's do that again on verse 7. Join with me, and we jump down to verse 10 for the chorus. Ready? Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now, I'm just going to show you the coda now so you know what it is when we get there. So verse 11 goes like this. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So we'll tack that in on the very last chorus, all right? So let's go down to verse 8. We'll do verse 8 and then verse 10. Here we go. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Now verse 9 and 10 and 11. Here we go. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever, the ju judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant. Is thy servant warned? And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Now that's great choir. Good job out there. Now I know that's new, and you just learned it. So now we're all professionals, right? How many of you like that? Okay, we're going to do it all over from verse 7 all the way through. Don't forget on the last one, we add verse 11 as a coda. At, at the end of the chorus. Here we go. Verse 7. Everybody together. Make sure the kids are singing. Matthew and Timmy and Melody, are you singing out loud? You are? 
All right, that sounds good. Let's sing it out good. Verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony. Uh, let's try it again. I almost messed it up there. Let's try that again. Rewind. Here we go. <laughs> the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Make wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. And in keeping of them, there is... I'm not even reading it right. Verse 10. Ah, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are pure, true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover by them is thy servant warned, is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is grace. God's people said? Amen. 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 It's good to sing the songs. Now when we get to glory, we'll have a chance to ask David to sing it for us because he wrote it and uh, he would have had a beautiful tune. Uh, it's too bad that the music and the notes, uh, there was no way to preserve that, but that gives us something to look forward to in heaven. I look forward to that, don't you? We'll have these great sing inspirations, all the saints of all the ages, and uh, David will be in the middle with his harp. Is this in the Bible? I don't know. It's just in my mind. It sounds good, doesn't it? I think there's going to be a lot of time for some good singing in heaven. And we'll get to find out what all these beautiful psalms sounded like when they were written. I'm certainly going to ask him to do that. All right, go ahead and turn back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. We're continuing to look at this wonderful verse at the end of the book, 2 Peter. Chapter 3, verse 18 is the last verse of the book. And the series title, you might say, is um, what to do in times like these. Really, what to do anytime, all the time. But uh, as we're in these dark days and difficult days, um, we've seen worse days as a nation. That's no, no doubt about that. In my lifetime, I've never seen something like this particularly. But what do you do in difficult times? What do you do in times like these? Well, here's what you do. Read it with me if you found it. 2 Peter 3.18. Here's what you do in times like these. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. That's what you do in times like these. Uh, we need to be growing in grace. We need to know the Lord better every single day. And we need to be passionate about giving God the glory. Uh, we spent two weeks looking at that phrase, grow in grace. Today, we're going to move on and look at that next phrase, the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. So the word grow is the command. We're, to, we're supposed to grow, but we're supposed to grow in two things, grace and also grow in knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior. We talked about how we grow in grace last week. You can't get more of God's grace than he's already given you because you received Jesus and with Jesus came every good thing. You received all the grace of God. If you trusted him as your Savior, then you've got heaven. You've got his blessings now. You've got the Holy Spirit in your heart. You've got the Bible. You've got his promises. You've got all the grace of God that you'll ever get. And so we're not supposed to get more of his grace. We simply grow in his grace. We talked about how a tree puts his roots down, hopefully into good, moist, healthy soil. And as those roots go down deep, the tree grows up and hopefully, eventually will bear fruit. Well, we need to be growing in God's grace every day. Uh, let me encourage you to go back. If you missed some of these uh, sessions, you can go back on our Facebook page, go to the videos tab. And you can scroll back and, and watch any sermon that you've missed. Uh, same thing on the YouTube channel. I would encourage you, if you've got extra time, to go back and watch or rewatch some of these things. Maybe even share it with someone that you think might uh, want to see it. Uh, today we're going to look at that one phrase, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First question is, is he your Lord and Savior? Is he your Lord and Savior? You can't grow in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior unless he is your Lord and Savior. Um, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He offers salvation to you. He said, whosoever will may come. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Are you trusting in him alone? I'll just say this very briefly, but it's a sad thought, but it's a true thought. There are folks who call themselves Christians all around the world, all around this nation, and I can't judge them. I don't want to judge them. But the scripture judges all of us. And the Bible says that our faith is to be in Jesus Christ alone. Salvation is not of ourselves. It's not of a religion. It's not because of what family you were born into. Salvation is only through simple faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of folks who would call themselves Christians who are trying to imitate him and trying to follow him. But following Jesus isn't the same as the new birth. How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve, right? So a disciple is a follower. Jesus said, follow me, right? So a disciple was a follower. Of those followers, how many of them were true believers? Eleven. We know Judas was a follower, but he was not saved, which is an amazing thought. Think about it. It's possible to be a follower of Jesus and yet never be a believer, a true believer, someone who's born again. Uh, he followed, but he'd never been born again. He'd never personally received Christ as his Lord and Savior. And so let me encourage you before I go any further, if you have not done that, it's as simple as being honest with God. Admitting that you're a sinner, confessing that you cannot save yourself, and putting all of your trust in him. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can't know him until you have been born again. And if you have any question about what that means, send us a message. We'd love to tell you more about that. So speaking to believers here tonight, we are called upon to grow in our knowledge of of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just talked about the, the 12 disciples. Uh, we are all supposed to be disciples. The Great Commission given to us in Matthew and then also in Mark and, and uh, there's different versions of the Great Commission as they're given at different times in those last days of Jesus before he went back to heaven. And the Great Commission includes a couple of elements. It, it says to go and preach the gospel, but it also says to teach and to train and to make disciples of all nations. So we're supposed to preach the gospel, and those who hear the gospel are to receive it by faith and then choose to become a disciple. What's a disciple? It simply means a learner. Uh, you could say follower, but the reason that the disciples followed Jesus is because they wanted to learn from him every moment of the day. Now, we're used to people going off to college or going off to a, maybe a trade school or in some cases, uh, uh, you know, there are even today boarding schools where, where kids do go to. I kind of 
pity that. I think it's uh, not probably the best situation in the world to be sent away from your family in most cases. But you know, the idea of going away and being uh, in a place of learning all the time is not a foreign concept, but this is certainly different than what we're used to today. Most people don't go and find a teacher and then spend every day and every hour and every meal and even sleeping under the stars if necessary. Uh, most people don't have that kind of education, but that's what a disciple was in those days. You would leave all that you had and you would go and literally follow that man, follow that teacher. And of course, Jesus, the God man, uh, was the best. Um, <laughs> Can you imagine being one of his disciples, spending all that time with him? It was not uncommon in those days for a teacher to have disciples like that. Uh, it was not uncommon for a philosopher or a great speaker to have a, a group of disciples that went with him everywhere he went. So Jesus had 12 disciples. They were learners. They were there to study his life, not just hear his words, but to watch how he lived. They were his disciples in that setting for about three to three and a half years. And so, let me ask you, with all that time spent with Jesus, after three, three and a half years, how well did they know Jesus? <laughs> did they know him real well? Now, they knew things about him that we don't know. They knew what he looked like. Isn't it strange that we don't have any account in the Gospels of what Jesus looked like? The only description of Jesus in the Bible is found in Revelation chapter 1, where he is seated now in his resurrected, glorified body, and it describes him shining like the sun. It's a wonderful description. I can't wait to see it with my own eyes. But we don't have any description of what he looked like when he walked this earth. We can assume he was ordinary, because Isaiah 53 says that, there was nothing about his visage or his image that we should desire him. He was plain or ordinary looking. Peter, James, and John, and Matthew, and uh, they all knew what he looked like. They knew what his favorite foods were. They knew what his patterns of life were. So they knew all kinds of things about him, but how well did they actually know him? We know that Peter had that glorious epiphany when he spoke and he said thou art the christ the son of the living god jesus had been asking uh, whom do men say that i am and and peter said thou art the christ the son of the living god but even then jesus said flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee peter but my father uh has given this unto you uh, i think personally that even though they spent three and a half years walking and sitting and learning at his feet, they didn't know him very well. They didn't even know fully who he was. On Friday, uh, people refer to it as Good Friday, the day that Jesus traditionally was uh, hung on that cross. And of course, there's some debates as to what exact day it was, but uh, many people celebrate that event, the event of the cross, on Friday. What, what, what was going on in the disciples' heads that day? If they really knew him, they wouldn't have been shocked. He explained why he was here. He explained his mission. He even told them exactly what was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem, that they were gonna, uh, he was going to be uh, captured and beaten and slain, and then the third day rise again. He told them all those things, and yet they didn't remember it. When it really came down to it, they didn't know Jesus that well. You know, sometimes we can think, boy, I wish I knew Jesus like they knew him. I wish I could spend time with him. I wish I could have been in his presence. Um, and boy, I do too. It would be wonderful. But go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and notice something. As much as it would be desirable to spend that time with him day in and day out, um, that kind of revelation of Jesus is not actually what we need the most. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter recounts that moment when he and James and John were invited to go up with Jesus to the top of the mount, we refer to as the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus revealed his deity in full glory to them. And he recounts that 
at the end of the first chapter here, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16 says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So once again, they got to walk with him, talk with him, and see him with their eyes. What kind of things did they see? Well, we know they saw the miracles, but he goes right to this pinnacle moment when he, they got to see him on the top of that mountain. Verse, um, verse 17, for, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So, you might think that's the pinnacle of revelation, is to see such a sight with your own eyes. And yet the next phrase, verse 19, says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. He's saying the word of prophecy that he's writing and speaking, he goes on to talk about the scriptures which were inspired and written down, but he says, look, the word of prophecy, the scriptures themselves, are more sure than what I saw and heard with mine own eyes, even on that mountain when I heard the voice of God. My point is, as, as, as much as it'd be great to walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus, if Peter and James and John could spend three and a half years by his side and still not really know who he was, then you might say, how can we know Jesus? How can we know him better? Well, I'm going to give you three things tonight, and the first one is right in front of us. We know Jesus through the scriptures. We know Jesus through the scriptures. Look what it says again. We have a more, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not, un, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So what Peter is literally saying, what we saw and heard with our own eyes, as marvelous as that, it was, as that was, the word of prophecy written down in the Holy Scriptures is more sure than human experiences. You know, it would be phenomenal, theoretically, I guess, it would be phenomenal if we could have a vision of Christ. But according to the Bible, that's not necessary. Someday we're going to be in heaven. That's not a vision. That'll be the real deal. That'll be good enough. But even if I were, even if you were to supposedly have a vision of Christ where you saw him and talked with him, that vision of Christ is not sure, meaning it's not stable and steadfast. It's not a good foundation because you could forget what you thought you saw. Over time, it could get fuzzy or it could get kind of exaggerated. You know, our minds can play tricks. People would have to take your word for it, wouldn't they? And they might think you're crazy. The point is, People can forget or distort or misinterpret something they experience. They can even make it up. But the Word of God is black and white. It's on the page. It's set in stone. It's preserved for every generation. And we have a, a, a prophecy, a revelation, God's holy word. And this is how we know the Lord Jesus Christ. Not through signs and wonders, not even through, if it were possible, to walk with him every single day. As much as that would be wonderful, you and I have an advantage over the, over the 12 disciples. Did the 12 disciples have the completed scriptures? No, they didn't. They had the Old Testament, which they could go and sit and listen to, and I'm sure they did. They didn't have the completed scriptures. Did the, did the 12 disciples have the indwelling Holy Spirit? On the inside. No, they didn't. And so though they were walking with Jesus, you and I get to walk with Jesus on the inside. We get to have a better knowledge 
of the Lord Jesus than the disciples could when they were with him face to face. Now, as we talk about knowing Christ and growing in our knowledge of Christ, we see the scriptures emphasized over and over again. Uh, so go quickly to a couple places. First, go to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. And we're going to see the words of Jesus, which he spoke not too long before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and was betrayed. John chapter 15, this is where he speaks of the vine and the branches. Abide in me and I in you. All right, and so look what it says starting in verse 5. I am the vine, Jesus says, verse 5, John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye, cannot, uh, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Simply speaking of the worthlessness of, or profit, profitlessness of a life that's not abiding in Christ. Verse 7, look at this very carefully. If ye abide in me, and my, what's the next phrase? And my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Abiding simply means resting in. As a Christian, we're to rest in Jesus, in fellowship with Jesus every day. According to, according to this verse, you cannot abide in him without his, without his words abiding in you. Amen. You want to abide and have rich fellowship? You've got to let the word of Christ, as Colossians chapter uh, 3, 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So you cannot know Jesus unless you are soaking up this book. Amen. This book is the revelation. It's the sure unshakable revelation of who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is so connected to the scriptures that one of his titles, one of his names is the word. John chapter one says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the living word. Our Bible is the inscribed inspired word and they are one meaning there's perfect unity between Jesus and the scriptures. You cannot know him more if you're not in the Bible more. Amen. So say, how do I grow in grace? We talked about that. You're going to grow in grace by learning to rely on him rather than relying on ourself. How do we grow in the knowledge of Christ? By deepening our love for the scriptures, spending more time in the scriptures, when there's opportunity to gather with God's people, hear it preached, hear it taught, be there so you can learn and let the Spirit of God stir your heart and open your eyes and whet your appetite for further study on your own. Christians ought to be in their Bibles every single day. Boys and girls out there, were you in your Bible today? Moms and dads out there, were you in your Bible today? What do we do in times like these? Things are dark. People are out of work. There's a virus. It's scary. People are wearing masks everywhere they go. What, what do you do in times like these? Well, how about instead of uh, wasting time, mm. filling our minds with all kinds of useless knowledge or mindless entertainment, maybe we should spend extra time in the Scripture. Amen. The blessed man, the blessed man, what did he do? Psalm 1, in his law doth he meditate day and night. You know, if you're going to know Jesus better, you've got to know him through the scriptures. And you'll never know them uh, fully, the sight of heaven. They're so rich, they're so deep, they're so wonderful. Keep on digging. Uh, they're like hid treasure, the Bible says. All right, so the scriptures reveal the Lord to us. Let me just say as well, as we connect the idea of growing in grace with growing in the knowledge of Christ, grace is God's gift of wisdom and strength. It's all of God's riches at your disposal, right? But grace is also Jesus. Jesus is all that grace is. 
The word Jesus comes from the word Jehovah. Jesus means Jehovah saves. Do you remember what Jehovah means? Jehovah, uh, the, the Hebrew sounds like this, Yahweh, it simply means I am. Do you remember where that came from? When Moses was shy and scared and bashful and, and didn't know what to do, and he was called to go to Pharaoh, and, and Moses initially objected, and he said, Whoa, they won't know... Uh, they, they won't know who I represent, and who will I, t who will I tell them sent me? And God spoke to him out of the bush and said, Tell them, I am hath sent thee. I am that I am, is the way God put it. It's a strange name, isn't it? I am? Well, it's a wonderful name. I am means that God is. You can't add anything to who he is or what he is. He is perfect and complete existence. He, he exists outside of time. That means he's also presently with you now. He is always in the present tense. But also, we find throughout the Old Testament that that word, I am, would often have something added on to the end of it to complete a sentence. Just like Jesus' name means Jehovah is, I am, Jehovah is salvation, you have Jehovah Jireh. You have Jehovah uh, Nisi, you have all these different ones. I am your provider. I am your protector. Uh, the Old Testament is filled with I ams. So here's the point. We're to grow in grace. That's God's riches and God's blessing, God's favor on your life as a Christian. But that grace is really the extension of a person, and that person is Jesus. So you see, they, they go together. If you're going to grow in grace, you better get to know the person of grace. Amen. That's Jesus. Jesus is the I am. All the grace you need comes from Jesus, so you better know him better. You better draw near to him. You better make it your purpose to grow, not just in what you can get from him, but grow in your love for him. And it's very, very important to know that. Sometimes folks focus on the grace they need from God. And we all need grace from God. Anybody need help and strength and grace from God? And so we can focus on the grace that we need, but ignore the person of grace who gives all that grace. And we, we ignore the relationship with him. God doesn't just want us to focus on what we can get from God, but God wants us to enjoy him for his own sake. Ever wonder why sometimes God makes us seemingly <laughs> useless? Now, nobody's useless. But ever felt kind of useless? Anybody felt kind of useless? Maybe you were sick. Maybe you couldn't get out of bed. Maybe, someone you, maybe somebody listening right now, you're, you're in pain. You can't get around like you used to. You don't feel as useful as you used to. And you think, why did God put me in this place to feel so useless? Now, first of all, nobody's useless because you can worship him and love him and you can pray and you can do whatever God enables you to do. But I think sometimes God does limit what we can do to teach us a simple thing. God actually cares more about his relationship with you than what you do for him or what he makes you do or what you can get out of him. Sometimes we think the relationship we have with God is like this. God has things for me to do, and I have things I need from God. Now, that's true. God has things for you to do, and I have lots of things I need from God. But that relationship is not as intimate as simply saying, you know what, I just want to love Jesus because I want to know him better. Not just I want to serve Jesus, but I want to know Jesus. Not just, Lord, I need more help, but I just want to spend some time in your word to know you better today. Sometimes God puts us to a standstill where we can't do much and, 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 and we don't know what to ask him for. And all we can do is get in the word and know him better. Sometimes God does that. And it's during that time he draws us near. Now, I want to move on quickly to the next two points. Uh, and I will go a little quicker on these. How do we know Jesus? We know him through the scriptures. Secondly, we know him through service. So God does want us to serve him. And as we serve him, 
That's actually a wonderful way to know him better. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Talking about growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him first of all through the scriptures, but then we know him practically through service. Meaning that we begin to serve others and we begin to do his work with him. Matthew chapter 11. And look at these beautiful words starting in verse 28. We have a salvation invitation in verse 28. Come unto me, Jesus said. Come unto me, all ye that are lit, that are sorry, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the salvation call. Once you come to him for that rest, now we find discipleship in verse 29. This is for believers. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Does Jesus only save you if you measure up? No. He saves us as we are. Praise God. We come to him with our heavy burden of sin, and he comes and he takes it from us. No strings attached. Salvation is free if you'll trust him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And once we come to him and we receive salvation, the Lord wisely has another call. And that's a call to service. Look what it says in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. What was a yoke? A yoke was a heavy carved piece of wood that had two horseshoe shaped notches in it or, or places on it where you could uh, put it over the necks of beasts of burden like an ox or, or mules. And so they would strap them in into this heavy yoke. And of course, that's attached to a plow or to a, a wagon full of supplies. And so the yoke was a place where animals had to submit. They had to submit to a burden and to a task. They had to submit to a master who would guide them left and right. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. So we give him our burden of sin. Praise God. And once we're saved... He gives us the call and the opportunity, really, to serve him. But notice this. He doesn't say, yoke up and serve me. He says, take my yoke. And folks, the amazing thought is just as a yoke has two spots for two animals, he's, he's literally asking us to yoke up with him. Jesus is picturing himself in this as one of the beasts of burden. The idea is that Jesus is on his side and he calls us to yoke up with him and that together we will serve side by side. Do you know how they would train a new ox to pull in a team? They would take a strong, seasoned, mature ox and then they would take the young one and yoke him up with the seasoned, mature ox. And once his neck is securely locked in place, they begin to go. And you can imagine what that young ox would do. Do you think he liked having his neck pinned in that yoke? <laughs> Not at all. He'd be braying and making a noise and, and fighting and pushing and pulling. But he's not going to get out. And pretty soon he figures out, you know what? The best thing for me to do is to follow the lead of the ox next to me. And so pretty soon the young ox learns to match his pace and match his step with the lead animal. And even though he's young and not as strong, he begins to, to walk and step with the other, other ox. And what happens is the burden becomes easy and the burden becomes light. And in fact, it becomes enjoyable as it begins to serve and do the task it was made to do. Jesus is saying, once you come to me for salvation, now... Yoke up with me. And look what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. First, uh, 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. One of the ways we learn of him, one of the ways we grow in knowledge of him, is by serving with him. This is the amazing thing. When we serve Jesus Christ, we also serve with Jesus Christ. I am so glad that as I preach, 
now or any other time. I'm so glad I'm not just serving for him, but I'm serving with him. I couldn't preach without his help, without his presence, without his, his guidance, without his mercy and grace. We can't preach, we can't win souls, we can't serve others without walking with him and serving with him. It's not just that we serve him from a distance, but he actually comes down with us. He gets in the yoke next to us and he says, watch me, follow my lead, match your steps to mine, learn my meekness, learn my lowliness, and you're going to find rest unto your soul deep down satisfaction on the inside. There's a lot of grumpy Christians who don't know Jesus very well. They're saved from, from hell, praise God. They're born again by grace through faith, but they have not learned to serve with Jesus. They've rejected the yoke of service, and therefore they don't know Jesus very well, and they haven't found that sweet inner rest that comes when you do what you're supposed to do and you and you fulfill the purpose God has given you in this life. Amen. You know, some things you just can't learn in a book. Now, I'm not diminishing what, what I said about the scriptures, but if all you did was read the scriptures and you never served, you would not grow. Amen. We have to read it and learn it, but then we have to go put it into practice. We have to get to church, find a place to serve. If it means pushing a vacuum or painting a wall, or if it means bringing a meal to somebody who needs help, or if it means just pitching in when we all go out into the community and, and leave a flyer or knock on a door, or if it's if it's mowing the lawn. You know, last summer I was just amazed how many gentlemen uh, volunteered to help us keep our lawn mowed. So well, that's not ministry. Yes, it is. That's ministry. Somebody had to get out there and ride that lawnmower and, and make, the, make, the, make it look beautiful. You know what? When you learn to serve one another in the church and out of it, when you learn to serve, what happens is you begin to know Jesus better because you're spending time with Jesus in the trenches. You're spending time with Jesus on the trail. You're spending time with Jesus uh, while pulling that plow. You know, I wish I could have spent more time with my grandfather. I have two grandfathers, both in heaven, of course. Uh, two grandfathers, they're both saved, and they're both um, both preachers, actually. Praise God. It's an amazing thing. Um, but my grandpa Barber was, when I knew him, he was retired, and he was working uh, in a print shop, and uh, he was he was handy. He could build things. He could make things. And I remember as a little boy, there were a few times when I got to spend some time with him in the garage as he was tinkering on things or fixing things. And I didn't ask too many questions. I didn't know what questions to ask. But just being with him, I felt like I was learning and, and getting to know him better. I just have short memories of that. He passed when I was about 12. But I remember those times, not what he taught me, but I remember the times where I was with him. And you know, sometimes you're going to learn far more about Jesus, not just by putting it in your, in your head, but by getting it down into life, serving one another, singing in the choir, using your talents for Jesus Christ, coming and sitting in the pew and being a friend, edifying and building up one another in the body of Christ. And that's where you're walking with Jesus and learning him on the job learning with him in real life. So how do we learn of him? How do we grow in our knowledge of Christ? Through the scriptures and then through service. There's something about Jesus you'll never learn if you don't get involved in other people's lives. Jesus was constantly serving. And Jesus says, follow me. If you're following Jesus, you're going to be busy in other people's lives, serving and helping in the local church as well. Finally, last but not least, go to Philippians chapter 3. We've seen that Jesus, well, we get, to know, we get to know him through the scriptures. We get to know him through service. But now in Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to end on a down note a little bit. It's not really a down note, but you'll see what I mean in just a second. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. 
Paul is writing about knowing Jesus. Verse chapter th Philippians 3.10 says this, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. Stop for a moment. Sunday is Easter Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. We all want to know the power of God in our lives. Amen? We all want to know the power of God in our lives. But, he says, in order to know that, I need to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Look what it says. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. No, we all like the mountaintop, don't we? Nobody likes the valley. <laughs> if you're going to know Jesus in his power, you also have to know Jesus in the sorrow. The Bible calls Jesus the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus knew about grief. And you can't know Jesus if you don't accept what he's trying to teach you through the sorrows and the sufferings of life. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I think sometimes we do not receive the full power that God wants to give us because we reject or refuse the lessons he teaches us in the valleys of suffering. If you can draw near to him in the dark, if you can draw near to him in the pain, if you will choose to, to praise him through the suffering and through the tears. And if you'll learn to, to find sweet kinship with the Lord, fellowship, it says. If you learn to fellowship with him during the times of suffering, I think God will break us and humble us and begin to trust us with greater blessings in other ways. You know, God's glory is something he guards very carefully. The Bible says his glory he will share with no man. And if we're not broken of our pride and of our self, if he did give us the power of the full power of, 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 of his resurrection and, and the, 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 the anointing of the Holy Spirit and revival from on high, all the things that we'd like to see, I suppose, if God gave you all that wonderful blessing, but there was no brokenness on the inside, there's a good chance we would take the glory. That's why God often softens us up, breaks us down. And there's something about Jesus that can only be learned through the fellowship of his sufferings. Why? Because you're being made conformable unto his death. We're learning in Sunday school the verse, I'm crucified with Christ. And that's a fact but it also is an attitude of life every single day to die to ourself, to die to our own desires, to die to our pride, to die to our own desire to be in charge. And you know what? When we are going through pain and suffering and loss and we choose to let go of our will and let go of our plans and we sink down into the promises of God, and we draw near to him during the hard times, what happens is we die, but in a good way. Our pride is put to death. Our selfishness is put to death. Our self-will is put to death. And when that takes place, folks, we begin to draw near to Jesus in a new way. We begin to fellowship with him through his sufferings. Let me give you an example of how this works in real life. I'm not a combat veteran. I cannot relate to what it's like to be in combat. I've not, I've not served the military. There is a brotherhood among those who serve in the military. Whatever branch it is. Especially those who've been in combat. And if you're listening to this and if this is your story, then you, you know what I'm talking about. And you can have two guys who they, they didn't serve together, maybe they didn't even serve in the same time or the same war or the same conflict, and they don't know each other at all, but all of a sudden they get to talking and they realize they're both brothers. They have an instant fellowship. They have an instant kinship. They know each other, even though they don't know each other, because they've both tasted similar suffering. 
they know each other because they've been through the same thing. And look, look at Jesus Christ. He suffered immensely. He suffered on the cross. He suffered in his life, but then he suffered in his death. And you cannot say you know Jesus unless you've shed a, a tear and shed some blood and had insults and, and had loss and had pain and, and mockery and shame. If you've not tasted those things, then there's just a certain level of knowledge and intimacy with Christ that you won't have. Somebody who has suffered with Christ and suffered for Christ and they know about sorrow and they know about betrayal and they know about loss, those people can draw near to Christ in a deeper way because they have kinship. They have something in common with Jesus that can only be found in the suffering times, in the hardship. And the loss. And Paul said, I want to know Jesus so deeply and so badly and so sincerely. I don't just want to know his power. I want to know him in his sufferings. And I want the Lord to make me conformable to the very death of Christ. To break me down and mold me and reshape me. The longer we live, the more we do suffer, the more we taste of hardship. But I think that what makes the difference is when you go through that pain, do you choose to draw near? Do you lean in to Jesus? Do you lean in through prayer? Do you lean into his promises? Do you keep your eyes up looking to him and, and, and trusting in the hope of salvation, trusting in the reality of heaven? Do you lean into the Lord? Do you find intimate times with prayer and fellowship and worship when you're going through the hard times? If you do, you are growing in your knowledge of Christ. There are some right now, no doubt, you're suffering. And the good news is, while I'm, I pray with you that God will heal you, and God can, and God very likely will in many cases, but if he chooses not to, God is giving you the opportunity to know him, to know him in a way that others can't, because you're sharing his sufferings. And you're drawing near to him uh, in a way that is very unique and special to you. You have an inside secret that just the two of you know. And he'll understand and you'll understand. And you'll have a wonderful, wonderful blessing of fellowship. Knowing him through the sufferings. How do we grow in our knowledge of Christ? Through the scriptures, through service, and through sufferings. Don't reject the suffering. Lean into Jesus and rest in his word and accept them and trust in him and let God just nourish your soul by knowing him better. That's what to do. That's what we ought to do in times like these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Teach us to know you better. Teach us to draw near. And teach us, Lord, to love you with all of our heart. Help us to spend time in the scriptures. Help us to learn of you through service. And Lord, help us to not reject the suffering, but accept it from your hand, at least as much as knowing that we want to get all we can get out of it. We want to know you better during the times of suffering. Certainly, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for relief. We also pray to know the fellowship of your sufferings, to know you better. Purify us. Draw us near. Comfort those who are suffering right now. And Lord, I pray that you'd reward their faith by giving them a special blessing in their time with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll continue with the last installment next Wednesday. In the meantime, God bless you. We'll see you Sunday for our Easter service at 1045.